I don't think that there's any sense in trying to make more out of a situation than there is. But I just personally can't take death seriously. I take suffering seriously, you know, pain and the projection of pain. And there's this relation. I have to deal with people that go and they're driving in their cars and they have their dogs in the back and they'll sometimes, I haven't seen one fall out before, but I've heard. I think that she's had this pregnancy much in the same way that I've known other people to have pregnancies. And, you know, it's easy to speak. It's not likely that it will happen to me. But you do see that there seems to be a physiologic emergency about things that I could never experience. A kind I hear of, that there's the possibility of that happening. and I Sleep relationships, too. I've had a lot of distortion in that. And one of the things that just keeps beginning to disturb me more and more is the, the, the supreme trinity. Fucking eating and sleeping, you know, and the sleeping is now beginning to get disordered. And that I've always said, sometimes I have to just get up in the middle of the night and I have to go to the bathroom, but it's always at the same time, though, each night. I, have I just don't think that it works. I don't think things like that ever work. And I know it's a kind of, uh, it's a built in prejudice on my part. It's, uh, you know, I've, I, 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 I feel like it. it's wandering. I, th I think that's what it is. I think it's wandering. Um, it's, it's walking out and thinking that you're going to that room and you have to be there in a certain amount of time and then all. But you mean something very special by wandering. And this is a kind of uh, 30s sense of interpretive analysis uh, that I've always, I like to say I have trouble with. Waiting for something to happen. That's what it is. It's waiting for something to happen. When I was a young boy, <laughs> I had the idea that um, I might um, pursue some kind of futuristic kind of environment which involved a mysterious combination of electronics and ill-defined sexuality. And I my can friend, see that my friend he just looks forward to his next birthday. That brings back the whole question of dragging cripples through snow that after just a short few years, that's all that's left of the memory, is just dragging, sweat, the cold, and the crippledness, the, you know, just all of the brokenness of it, you know, just... Um, Sometimes there's people with crippled minds, I've realized that, you know, and it has nothing to do with snow or winter or any of that, it just has to do with the people that are grasping... I'd really like to have been able to see them. Uh, I should be there now, in fact, you know, and... Um, but uh, the whole sense of the thing is uh, um, gone off to a kind of, uh, you know, you, you, you make the analogy. It will, happen, it will happen really soon. It will happen instantly, and then you'll be surprised by it. You won't know what to do. It will it'll just... You know, I um, think that repetition is probably one of the things that I've had the most difficulty with in my life, because I don't have a good sense of uh, recall. I know I used to have to work these uh, band jobs, you know, as a pianist. And by the nature... Scientists are always talking about the galaxies and how there's an order to them and all that, and they would show these three-dimensional representations of them, and I'm looking at them, and they're saying, see, there's a tree here. This is this is form that looks like a tree or a man. And it was the nicest gift. Uh, but it's the kind of gift that people who have children in the age of 6 to 14 give. It was a gift which is not really sent to me, but for the child that I didn't have. And, uh, but I've gotten into the habit of it, you see. In other words, I know how to play this game now. And so I immediately went out and I bought some tiny little finger monster puppets because I knew that what was really being meant... I have another was, friend who likes to go to stores and he says his most favorite stores to go to are the ones with the broken toys and not the ones, you know, like... That'll have nice like this at the dollar a day store, or the dinner, no, not dollar a day. I mean, you know, I could spend a dollar a day, but dollar, nothing more than a dollar, that's it. The nothing more than a dollar store, you know. The 99 cent stores. There's one that's really close to where I work. I that sounds it. like a bargain. <laughs> 99 cents as opposed to a dollar. No, but I think, you know, we begin to wonder if it's not some mechanism for just dumping, uh, that it's a dumping mechanism, you know, a way in which you, uh, you dump. You know, and, Speaking uh, of work, you know, when I'm at work, they have these people... And that that's the three contexts of dump to me. There's the dump, you know, for a while I thought, from now on I'll call the work that I do dump one, dump two.
because I got so interested in the idea, you know, of the way in which computers yep. jump. You, you now know? have and a connection with computers now, mm -hmm. and computers are all over, and a friend came over to my house and wanted to know why I didn't have a computer. And I thought for a while, and I, and I was just, I, 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 was, I was at a loss. I, I, I just... Well, then there is the hormonal drive. I think that in some ways, everything is so completely dominated by the... To say chemistry alone is a mistake, you know, I mean, that's, that's to tie the situation down so neatly to make such a compacted mess of the idea, a compacted mess, compacted the P mess. P PBS programs where they show these things over and over again, um, they, they keep showing them and you say to yourself, yes, I've seen this program before. But I have had interesting information conveyed in that way. I mean, things I had never ever thought about before, you know, just by accident, you'll have the occasion. That's one of the excuses people make for social intercourse. And then I got thinking about travel, you know. I'm not a traveler. I hate travel. I've never had any interest in travel. And sometimes I'm driven to travel just simply because of the fulfillment of obligations. Once that obligation is made... Do you feel that you need to go and travel uh, to the same place often, or do you like to explore? Are you the, are you the kind of person that explores? You know, there's the question about animal sounds, the ways in which we imitate the sounds of animals, and the, uh, the ways in which in each language you attempt to try to find some kind of verbalization of that animal experience. And I, I just recently was looking at uh, the settings of songs of the Quet HD that came from, uh, I think, the teens or 20s. And I was fascinated looking at the two or three different language conceptions of cricket sounds. There was uh, James Joyce, and uh, there was a program about him, and they were trying to make this connection. Um, more and more, you know, my life is just down to what's on television tonight. Because it was always there. I mean, uh, you know, I, I didn't want it at first, you know, either. That's the strange thing. It was almost as if the necessity for having that kind of um, entertainment had more to do with the acquisition of a certain uh, fluidity. Sometimes you wonder whether people wanted to see that kind of thing over and over, the grotesqueness of, of life. And sometimes. Don't you find that when you're wearing something like that, that it really just makes you seem like you're being strangled? And yet I also wonder, too, why men object to the tie. My mother understand. didn't like the idea of laying in bed and having, um, you know... Now, this brings us to something very important, though. Uh, uh, is your mother living or dead? Uh, she's living. Uh, she is living. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when she's Please. living, she's... When she's living, she, she lives life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And when she's sleeping... And what exactly do you mean by living life to the fullest. Is that like a, like an oxymoron? I think that the real reason for her ambiguity is an uncertainness about wanting to go down that road. That it seemed like it was fun at first, but that the stakes have gotten too She high. leaves home and she drives, and it's a regular everyday activity of driving to work and getting to work and sitting behind the counter and helping customers and going home and getting, you know, laying down and watching TV. Uh, you're, you're, you have this conception there of help. Um, you have a conception of help. And can, can you have help? if you're paid to do the helping. I mean, and so as a consequence, is it possible to perform a compassionate act? Sometimes when you go through your whole life in a high position... Then there is the further extension in the direction of just the sense of evil itself. In other words, is evil compounded because of its mechanization? Does that in some way intensify the distance between where these arbitrary lines are good and evil? Or uh, is it... Um, Sometimes is it, high position makes you feel that way. There's a good and an evil, and you don't know where to draw the line at. And you have to say, well, that's the person that I work for, and I'm the employee. And if I feel like I know more than the employer, then I put myself in a strange position sometimes. But I have to think that way sometimes. Last night, I had delicate miniature corn. And it's something that became fashionable for a while. And I think it's come back again, the little delicate miniature corns, the little hybrid corns. And um, 
usually people like them pickled. Uh, they become very popular. They're almost uh, replacements for pickled okra pieces now, you know, in, in certain places along with pickled peaches. A sweet we pickle. have a garden and uh, the landlord was going to come by and uh, take a look at our garden, not because that was his specific interest, but the fact that so many other people that were living in the house at times before just didn't take care of things. And he was so happy to see that we had... You know, I can just remember the whole consequence, the consequences of of dog ownership and and living in the city and the ways in which living in the city and owning a dog as a pet animal uh, changed your whole uh, relationship to things in ways that uh, the English now are getting rid of all those uh, bulldogs and all those terrible awful dogs that bite your leg and just you know attack you all the time those those big mean well you know um, you could take many... When I say get rid of, I mean kill. I, I don't mean um, just like, well, we're going to move them somewhere else. It means killing. The only uh, satisfactory distance between um, these connections... You I know, they'll do, it, they'll do it again. They'll keep killing them and killing them and killing them until they... I mean, it's like cats. Cats are like all over the place, you know? And, and are they going to do it to cats too? Now, I think it's a matter of number. There's something about the nature of the heat that uh, changes your relationship to um, presence. Uh, it's, 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 it's a temporal effect, a very gentle sweating. It, it makes you feel like all of the impurities are coming you out. You have to evaluate someplace in the uh, range of interpersonal relationships uh, the exact qualifiers of the womanliness of a woman and the manliness of a man. Uh, an obsessive... Quaint. But, uh, and quaint. Um, that's quaint. I've, I've thought of it as being, yes, quaint. He had only two more months, I think, to live at that point and never said anything about it. And as a consequence, when his sister called me... Was it Neil Armstrong that he felt, that was the guy, I think that was the astronaut who fell in the bathtub after, you know, orbiting the Earth and whatnot? It's think. a very strange thing because many of these people who have gone on these moon flights, um, you could make a bad joke about it and you could say they have just come back loony. Uh, but you can also see how just the very sense of the farther we get from the trees, the less of the kinds of monkey connect. I wonder whether it matters or not. I mean, sometimes when they say... That connects directly to the relationship of the sense of knowledge and the sense of self-awareness that other creatures other than human beings seem to be able to have from our standards of evaluation. And looked at in that way, it's almost as if the critical issue is the evaluation. To know Are we the ones to evaluate? Know. No. Are we the ones to evaluate? I mean, we're, we're in this position we're, we're kind of in this position where we're, we're, as human beings, trying to evaluate ourselves. It's like the... Sure. Oh, well, I, uh, um, They talk about the eye looking at itself. But this is just a frustration. You know, you, you, you have this, uh, uh, this, this way of trying to generate a sense of frustration, and then everything from that sense of frustration is just a modulation of it. And then you just call that structure. I mean, you have a certain way, you set up a situation in which frustration can exist, and then you pretend that what you produce is structure. The eye sees and the ear hears, and you can't let one... I have to make some kind of uh, connective... Uh, um, it's like the lower lip. I mean, uh, it has to pop on that, you know? That there has to be some... Oh, I don't know. Interrelationship. Uh, that can be made. I mean, otherwise, the duality of... Uh, Once I took a, a text uh, of which um, it's a very, very hard text to get, and I subjected it to... I had uh, the most interesting text cited to me, you know, on this very subject, uh, because I assume you're talking about text in the sense of the most generalized sense. Um, but these were historical texts as well. They were texts that consisted of symbols and signs that apparently no one has ever satisfactorily deciphered. And it's odd because of all of the John D. charts, you know, that people thought I would know something about it. And it's strange, I've never There is a glossary of signs and symbols that, that is out, and um, it's all numbered, and that's what I love. There was a time when I had a lot of need for things like that, when 
I felt like there was a constant need for more symbols, more signs, because I had to come up with ever finer gradations of subtle distinctions between one thing My and feeling is just to take this. But don't you think pitch is a major problem still in the articulation of non-vocal music? In vocal music, it could be also, too, but the only... I'm positively convinced now that the only thing that she meant by it was just a way of expressing a certain kind of uh, innate and pretty much comprehensive vulnerability. And I saw that... There's so many people that say je ne sais quoi and they don't know what it means. Well, I've not been good at language. You know, I've been trying for two or three years now to break out of just the English-only uh, mold. And I've not been very successful with that. And I think part of it, uh, because, uh, you know, I'm not alone in trying to do this. And I think part of it is just the age of entry. Tapes, make it, so that it's, tapes make it so that it's not easy to do that. I mean, are you using tapes of, of different languages to learn that way? Or are you... Are you, are you learning from, I mean, see, what, what happens is, is that when you have tapes of things and you listen to them, it's not natural. I mean, not any kind of auditory memory at all. I mean, um, and even very temporary pitch auditory memory. I can only remember a melody for 10, 11 seconds. Uh, back in the days when I used to do band travel and I'd do traveling uh, with these uh, uh, one night stand orchestras, you know, we'd go off and the big challenge was to me would be to remember whether I was in the second or the third repetition of the chorus or the verse. I could never remember and frequently what would happen is that everyone else would have gone on, you know, to the appropriate section, the appropriate part of the work. Sometimes when I was, you know, when I was younger, sometimes I would come out and I would uh, play drums in a jazz And band. you've brought up the frightening issue for us all is that there's a point at which when you were younger, Young, it's really younger, as young as you feel, as they say, but I hate to use that little cliche, but there are people that For I know... For some reason, in going through my, uh, uh, my parents' things, you know, I've been sorting through them, you know, and in the course of this sorting, and this grading, and this refining, and this... Uh, some parts has to be thrown in the trash, and others... I found all over tiny, tiny little pieces of paper with really quite horrible, grotesque jokes on them. I mean, really horrible and really quite grotesque, things that I would have never, ever heard my parents say. And you're wondering why they I've would... I've learned to make uh, Thai tea, and it's wonderful. The only thing is, is that trying to put... Well, no, I can give you, you know, I mean, you know, well, pardon me for interrupting at this moment, but uh, tea can be flavored with all kinds of things, and then there's tea smoking, in which it's a wonderful, convenient way. You can use a very small pan. I worry about the sugar, though. The sugar content in Thai tea is so high, and that's just the way they like it. I don't... Why the thing don't. that I think keeps them from coming to visit, you know, is that it's just the incidental story. It's not the comprehensive story. I mean, uh, I was just sitting quietly and I felt something at the top of my head and it was a scorpion dropping. <laughs> it's little things like that, you know, that uh, paints a kind Sometimes of Sometimes you can thing. find them in your shoes. Sometimes, too, when you walk out. The most here. painful experience my father ever had. Uh, was having a scorpion in a boot. It was a very tall boot, and of course he didn't know it was there. Put the boot on. In the old days when I was in Chicago, I had this longing for Texas, and I always felt like I needed to dress up like a Texan because there weren't any other Texans really around. Mm -hmm. but, or at least I had the feeling that there weren't any other Texans around. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I needed to get the shirt and get the boots and be the actual you know, so-called Texan. thinking more directly about ways in which religious preoccupation is also a kind of just a chemical definition in which you just don't have any causality, you've got no will. You know. I'm always drifting off into these meaningless digressions, I suppose, of uh, catalogs of, uh, of non -controlled. Religion it seems to be this, this kind of, well, I hate to really explain I mean, it. sometimes people have no sense of it. Uh, I'm honestly convinced, for example, that Stephen has no sense at all of the religious experience. It's just not there. Just not there. Uh, it's like the taste. We hear from a friend who, when the taste of fresh coriander comes into his mouth, he literally takes his hands and pulls the pieces of the half chewed I've coriander. I've seen people walk down the street and they look and they see a dead bird and they just don't blink. I've never it. felt that strongly about anything. I can't imagine anything I would feel that strongly about, except perhaps pain. And pain 
I'm constantly now just going back to pain. Don't you feel the uh, the pain when you see another animal that's that's hurting and or or dead? I mean, but there's but see that's it. That's you've hit right on the ultimate issue here. 